Good morning. This is the second day of me making a video for my YouTube channel that I'm attempting to do. I have cracked jokes for weeks and quite literally months about how I just need to make a little bit of money doing the YouTube game. But even if the only people that see this are the three people that are currently subscribing to my channel, that's okay because I feel it's important to do what God has led you to do, and I've been dragging my feet long enough. So this is me, hot mess, living blessed, still trying to do what God is asking me to do. This one's a little bit scary because it's my story, and I'm putting it out there for people to see and people to judge, and that's okay because it's what I'm supposed to do. And I am a firm believer in the power of threes. If something's been on your mind and you just can't shake it, and I don't think it's coincidence when you have multiple people or different situations that bring it up. It's kind of like when you have been thinking about buying those pair of boots and all of a sudden you constantly see ads on Facebook, it's kind of the same thing in real life. When you have something on your mind and random, random people, people that don't even know what you're thinking about make comments about it, okay, maybe that's an indication that you should put into action whatever it is that's on your mind. So I've now had my three. So here it is. I'm going to give you guys my story. And it's actually a story of hope, but it starts from trauma. It's about my baby loss story. Uh, so um, could be a tearjerker. I didn't put a whole lot of effort into doing my makeup today, just in case. Uh, but I also... I just wanted to share the story with you guys real quick. Um, there's this book, and I have it right here. Start Raving Obedience. And this book is awesome. Um, talking about putting into action what God has asked you to do and how do you know it's from God and, and how do you actually act upon that regardless of what society thinks. And in the very beginning of this book is a story about a lady in... Central Michigan. This could be an urban legend, but it's such a great story that I don't even care. Um, she was praying in the morning in her car, and she just said, God, use me. And whatever that looks like, I'm, I'm going to do it. And so she felt the urge to turn off the interstate and go to a 7-Eleven. And she's like, okay, well, this is weird because, like, why would God ask me to go to a 7-Eleven? And she sat there parked in the car, and all of a sudden she had this thought. And it was, go inside, stand on your head next to the icy machine. Weird, right? Like, why would God ask you to do something so stupid? Like, it's stupid, right? So she did, after battling with it. And I think at one point in the story, like, she even drove off and then came back because there was urgency in her actions. And so... There's no cars in the parking lot. She's like, okay, well, thank goodness for that. So she goes inside and there's just one guy standing behind the counter. And she was like, well, maybe he'll go in the back and I can just go stand by the icing machine for whatever reason and he won't notice. But he didn't go anywhere. He just stood there behind the counter. So she was like, okay, you know, God asked me to do this. I've already put steps into the door. So I'm going to just go do it. So she walks over to the icing machine, stands on her head for a couple seconds and then uh, tries to bolt out the door. And before she could get to the door, the guy at the counter stopped her and he says, I need to know why you just did that. And she said, don't, don't worry about it. I'm so sorry to bother you. Just pretend it never happened. And he said, no, I need to know why you did that because just minutes ago, I had a gun in my mouth and I was ready to kill myself. And I was giving God one last chance and I said, God, if you're real, send somebody in here to stand on their head beside the icy machine. So I really need to know why you did that. That's kind of one of the story ends. But I'm just like, that's powerful. You never know if your actions are going to be inspiring or maybe the stupid thing that you do that day is going to show people that God really does exist. And you have no idea. But in that moment, you got to be an item that God was able to use. So uh, that's why I'm doing this. Um, 
so back to my story about Pinterest. If you're not sure if what you're hearing is from God, does it align with scripture? God's never going to ask you to do something that goes against what he has said in the Bible. Um, and there's so, I'm not even going to get into that right now, just because there is with our political unrest, with everything that's going on to society, I feel that that can just be um, misconstrued right now. We'll save that for another time, but it is important. Does it align with scripture? Um, secondly, pray and wait. Have you prayed about it? Have you made it a point to listen and say, okay, God, like, I'm open to this. Show me. Let me hear you. Have you prayed about that? Um, and thirdly, it's not about what you can do and about why. It's about God. And ideally, it's for God's glory. So those are three things that if you just have an idea and a thought you can't shake and you're wondering, is this coming from God or am I making this up or is this the devil or whatever, run it through those three things and see where it stands. So again, this is why I'm doing this video. It follows those three things. So uh, a couple years ago, I was doing dishes and there was a couple um, ladies in our church that had been talking about wanting to go to Romania. We sponsored a couple, we as in our church, sponsored a couple missionaries there and they were doing some incredible work and they were always looking for people to come over and see the work that they were doing and get some hands on and work with the kids. Um, they had a heart for the orphans and sadly in the country, the majority of the orphans still have both their parents. They've just been abandoned or they don't want them or it's safer for them to not be with their parents. Um, so there's a lot of work that goes on with the children there. And I think that's great. I was 100% behind these ladies going to Romania. They had a heart for children and I was just 100% behind supporting them. I don't really like kids. So I was always the girl that was like, Phew, God is going to use you. He's going to send you somewhere and you're going to do things for his glory. I'll be praying about you. Okay. Like I'm not going to work with kids because I don't like kids and judge me if you want, but I'm usually the last resort for my friends to babysit their children. And I think it's because I tend to treat them more like adults, like, Hey girl, instead of what are you up to? So it is what it is. Uh, I'm, just going and working with kids in an orphanage was not on my radar. And I was doing dishes and I distinctly remember thinking, um, almost feeling like I had been pushed over with the feeling that I was supposed to go to Romania. And I just was like, nope, I'm not gonna do it. I'm the last person they want working with kids. Not gonna do it. And then I started feeling urgency about it. And remember, we just talked about the three things. Does it align with scripture? Yes. Helping children? Pretty sure that aligns with scripture. Have I prayed about it? Hadn't at that point. I had been praying for other people, though. Um, so after a couple days, like, it just kept coming back. And it was more urgent and more urgent. And finally, I was like, okay, God, I will go where you send me. But then that little voice telling me I needed to go to Romania said, okay, now make sure you tell somebody. Because if I kept it a secret, maybe I didn't have to do it. So against my will, I got on my phone and I sent messages to the ladies that were thinking about going to Romania. And I said, guess what? I'm going to. That's what God said to do. And this is me saying, okay, God, use me. And at that moment, I didn't have a heart for it, but I was willing. So baby steps, right? Um, so prior to me deciding to go to Romania, I had prayed and asked God to give me a baby. And I'd been married for about three years to my husband. And I have a 14 year old son from a previous marriage. And I just felt like if we were gonna start a family and I wanted my son, my older son to be involved in it, uh, we needed to do this now because 
it's no secret at that much of an age gap, it was going to be really hard for any other children to be able to be involved in my son's life. And he's a pretty cool kid. So I really wanted that. Um, and I know I just said that I don't like kids, but it's kind of the same for pets. Like, I don't really like other people's dogs, but I love my dog. Kids are kind of the same. I think my kid's pretty cool. Doesn't mean I like everybody else's. Uh, so that was my prayer. God, give me a baby. Let us start a family. And so shortly after me declaring to the world that I was going to go to Romania, I found out I was pregnant. And that was a bit of a weird scenario with a trip to the emergency room and everything. But again, a story for another time. But uh, yeah, I found out I was pregnant. And I was terrified because it actually happened. And I associated me doing what God had told me, saying, okay, I am willing to go to Romania, meant he was honoring my obedience by giving me something that I wanted um, but then I got thinking, well, how am I going to go to Romania if I'm pregnant? Like, is it safe? Can I fly? Like, because I knew it was going to be a couple months down the road when we traveled. I didn't even know if this was possible. And so I was like, well, how does this timing, like, I don't really get it. But okay, like, if I have to wait a year to go to Romania, I said, I'm going to do it and I'm going to do it. So uh, weeks go on, months go on. Um, about four months into my pregnancy, I was sitting on the couch with my husband. We were, had just got done watching a movie and I stood up to go to the bathroom and I, I just felt like warm and I was like, great. I just pissed myself and I had no idea. And I turned around and looked and the couch was covered in blood and I was covered in blood and I freaked out full-blown panic. I ran to the bathroom. I grabbed a towel. I shoved it between my legs, grabbed another towel for the truck, and off we went to the emergency room. I was almost hysterical the entire ride. And we get there, and I'm walking through the emergency room with a towel shoved between my legs and trailing blood down the walkway to the room. I knew what was happening. I was losing my baby. And just heartbroken. So we get into the uh, room and the bleeding had pretty much slowed down at that point. Um, after about 20 minutes, it had kind of stopped. And so they brought in an ultrasound tech to do an ultrasound to check the baby. And I just was numb at that point. I think I had cried all my tears and I was just numb, just waiting for them to confirm for me what had happened. And they did the ultrasound and she goes, do you want to see your baby? And I said, okay. And he was moving around. He was just fine. So they did a couple more exams. And they said that it was most likely placenta previa, where my placenta may have attached itself and then detached itself. And that created the blood. And I'm just going to tell you, I am very squeamish about medical stuff, so I'm not going to get into any detail, like, more than that. So feel free to Google what that might be. Uh, anyways, because of that, I ended up having multiple ultrasounds where they, like, rolled the little card in and they, like, you know, the cold jelly on your belly and they did the ultrasounds and stuff just to check things out. So I had multiple ultrasounds um, every couple weeks just checking things out and I was good to go. And then finally my my big ultrasound came up, the one where they do the measuring and you find out the sex of your baby and all that fun stuff about how big it is and how far you're progressing and they see if your um, due date is still fairly accurate, all of that. And I remember being in the shower that morning, just, oh, hold that. I gotta, I gotta back back up a minute. Um, prior to my ultrasound, the big ultrasound, I went on a girls weekend trip with my friend Janelle and she was pregnant too. She was due about two months before me. And so what are the odds that two friends who dearly loved 
each other. We love to read books and then discuss them with each other. And um, she lived in Wisconsin. I lived in Nebraska. And so we like met halfway and we spent a weekend at the hotel and it was awesome. We just chilled. We ate um, Olive Garden and we watched TV and we did hair and it was just a wonderful weekend. And Janelle was showing me pictures of what she wanted to do with her nursery and what she was thinking color she wanted. And at this point, I don't think she had found out the sex of the baby, but she was still trying to um, plan for something like a color palette that would work with whichever sex. And I remember thinking, I haven't even considered starting to plan any of that stuff. I hadn't bought anything. I wasn't even on my radar at that point. And uh, so I just, I was like, well, that's weird for me. Like, I am excited about it, but why am I not doing anything? So then when I went home, I remember distinctly cleaning out the dishwasher. And I was thinking about our weekend together. And I was like, you know what? I should, I should start getting on Pinterest and looking at baby stuff and coming up with ideas with a nursery theme and, you know, what colors I wanted and looking at some cute baby outfits and what were some of the things new moms wanted to have. Do I need to get a pregnancy pillow? Like stuff like that. I was like, why shouldn't I start? Like I should start being excited and showing it. And I remember pulling a cup out of the dishwasher and I heard a voice and it was almost like someone was in the room talking to me. It was loud and clear. And I remember exactly what it said. It said, this child will break your heart. And I was startled and I dropped the cup because like I said, it felt like somebody was like talking in my ear. And I was like, well... I mean, I have a 14 year old son and he's regularly broke my heart. Isn't that a part of parenting? Like you've got ups and downs and you know, it's part of having a kid, right? And so I justified that thought away. And then I heard the voice again and it said, your baby will die. And it was a voice loud and clear as if somebody had spoken it in the room. And it startled me but I was able to convince myself that it was me being paranoid. It's probably something to do with pregnancy hormones, but uh, I remember that. And I don't know why I heard it. I tried to convince myself it was just the devil messing with me because God had given me a gift, right? So why would he take it? Especially when he gave me the gift because I was being obedient. That was my thought. And so I continued, I went on about my day. <clears throat> um, then I had my ultrasound where we did the measuring of the baby and you know, the one I just talked about. And I remember being in the shower, bawling my eyes out because I just had a horrible feeling something bad was gonna happen. And I was emotionally spent. Uh, the pregnancy had been kind of rough. I was nauseous and tired all the time and I was already in my second trimester and usually they do that big ultrasound earlier on but we had a really hard time fitting it into my schedule and my doctor's schedule so it was a couple weeks after when they initially do it and it was fine because I'd been getting those ultrasounds in between so they'd been checking the progress they knew everything was good there wasn't any issues but um that's why it was a little bit later. I think I was like five and a half months pregnant at that point, almost. I don't go by weeks. Weeks, I just like, nothing annoys me more when somebody's like, oh, my daughter's 38 weeks old. That's how old, two and a half? Okay, so I kind of refuse to do that. So five and a half months, we're just gonna say that. Um, so I was in my car driving to the ultrasound and I just was devastated and I had no idea why. So I called my BFF and I told her, I was like, I just need some prayer right now because I'm really struggling and I feel like something bad is going to happen or I'm going to get really bad mood news and I don't know what to do. So could you just pray for me because I'm kind of a hot mess right now. And she's like, sweetie, like, that's dumb. Like, yes, I'll pray for you, but nothing's gonna happen everything's been fine up until this point 
everybody gets an ultrasound at this point. Everybody checks the progress of the baby. It's going to be fine. There's not going to be anything wrong. Like, stop worrying. You're just, you know, being emotional. Go to your ultrasound and give me a call when you're done. Okay. So I go and they're doing all the measuring and stuff and you have to do it on a full bladder. So I distinctly remember thinking, okay, like I'm going to lose my mind if I can't go to pee anytime soon. And so they did all the, the measuring and stuff and the baby wouldn't turn so they could find the sex. Story of my life. Well, no, that doesn't really make sense. Um, anyways, so they did all the measuring and then I was like, I'm so sorry. I have to go to the bathroom now or I'm going to lose it. And she's like, no, that's good. We need you to go to the bathroom. And so I went to the bathroom and I thought we were done. And she's like, we're going to just take a couple more peeks now that you've gone to the bathroom. Okay. So I got back on the table and I spent another 10 or 15 minutes. And I didn't, I just figured that was part of how they did things nowadays. And so I got done and I, um, they're like, okay, we'll contact your doctor and you can head on down to the clinic and meet with her which was routine. So I walked the entire hallway from the hospital to the opposite end to the clinic and I sat there in the lobby. And all of a sudden, like it's five minutes maybe I sat there and all of a sudden my doctor come bursting through the door and she runs over to me and she's like, we need to get you to labor and delivery because your cervix is dilated. And I was like, what do you mean? What? And she's like, you're dilated two to six right now. So we need to get you to uh, labor and delivery. For anybody who doesn't know what that means, I'm not going into detail again. So please feel free to Google it. So they took me to labor and delivery and strapped me on a bed. Well, then they didn't strap me, held me in a bed and then tilted me upside down. <laughs> um, okay, I'll go with this. And they were... Ideally, what the doctor told me was that because my cervix was dilated to the extent that it was, there was a risk of my water breaking. And if that happened, I would go into premature labor. And my baby wasn't old enough at that point that his lungs were developed. So he would not be able to um, take breath if he was born at that moment. All the time this is happening, my husband's out of town for work. He's actually out of state in some training. And so I called him and I don't even remember if he answered or not because <laughs> he never answers his phone. Um, so I don't remember if I left a message or what the deal was. Anyways, he wasn't going to be there. And so I called him, told him what was going on. And in my head, I just, I was like, well, this will be fine. God gave me a baby. Like this is just a struggle we'll figure this out. It'll be fine. And they ended up taking me by ambulance to the larger city. It was about 30 miles away. And they admitted me there. They had a special department for premature babies and, and whatnot. So went there, met with the doctor and he wanted to perform a surgery um, called a cervical cerclage. Again, feel free to Google that. It's basically they sew your cervix shut. Um, if the surgery was successful, there was a good chance I was going to have to remain on bed rest for the remaining four months of my pregnancy. Uh, but we would cross that bridge, you know, once we got there. So there was all kinds of decisions that needed to be made, and it was fairly urgent, um, just because of the extent of of where my body was. And while this was all happening, my friend Shalina showed up and I'm very much one of those people that like, if I'm emotional or struggling with something, I don't want anybody around me. So, uh, my best friend that I had called that morning, she knew what was going on and she knew that I needed her back home. And I, I love her for that. But my friend Shalina was a 911 dispatcher and she found out what the ambulance was for and her boss who happened to be one of my amazing clients um took over for her so that she could come up to the hospital to be with me and i will always be blessed because of that so shalina if you're watching that thank you 
Um, but so she came up and she sat with me in the hospital and they prepped me for surgery. And I remember asking if I could go to the bathroom before they started surgery. And I was at this point afraid because I'm like, what if a foot falls out? Like, I don't know. And they're like, mm, just don't push hard. Like a foot's not going to fall out, but don't push hard. Just, you know, do your business and come back here. So I remember sitting on the toilet peeing and um, I remember praying and I wanted to pray, God save my baby. But <laughs> instead I prayed, come what may, let it be for your glory. Lord, use this and use me. And that was it. That's all I said. So I went back into the room, got on the bed. Um, they put the mask on, so I went under. And then I remember waking up to lights and uh, I started coughing and I felt myself pee a little bit. And I told the nurse that and I was so embarrassed. And I was like, I think I just peed a little bit. And she said, no, honey. That's ambiotic fluid. So I knew in that moment that the surgery didn't work and my water had broken. <laughs> and I knew at that point, like, that was a death sentence for my baby. And it hit me <laughs> that I wasn't going to get to have this gift. But I remember praying in that moment the Lord gives and the Lord takes blessed be the name of the Lord that's a hard thing to pray when you're going through shit but I meant it um whew. so went back to um the room and Shalina stayed in the hospital with me overnight and we kind of made a plan for what we were going to do. The doctor was very convinced that if I could stay pregnant, even though my water broke for at least two weeks, my baby had a good chance of living. So I was sent home with antibiotics so that I didn't get infection and put on bed rest and see what happens. Uh, prior to that two week mark, the chances were going to be very slim for him to survive. Oh, and we found out it was a boy. So we named him Noah. Uh, and if you look it up, Noah means comforter. Fitting, right? So I went home. I was on bed rest and just waiting for something to happen. I watched a lot of TV. I read some books. Um, I was just kind of numb through it all. And then I finally did go into labor. And I think it was on like day eight or nine after my water broke. And I knew what that meant. And so I called my friend, uh, Emily, and I told her I thought I was in labor. And I called the hospital and asked them, you know, what should I do? I think I'm in labor. Do I need to come in and... They told me that, no, you need to go to Lincoln to the premature labor department. And my gynecologist was so amazing. Like, if I broke my arm, I'd want to go see her because she was so amazing. And I was like, I'm so sorry. Can you just put my doctor on the phone, please? Because she wants to be here for me. And she requested that I call her if this happened. So a couple minutes later, the nurse gets back on the phone. She's like, yep, come in. So uh, my friend came and got me and drove me down there. She left work, uh, didn't even hesitate. Like she just came and got me. So she dropped me off at the hospital um, and waited with me the whole time. And at this point, my husband was back. So he, I called him and he was able to come and be there with me. So it was labor and... I was in labor for just a couple hours. I didn't want an epidural because that can sometimes slow it down. And when you know 
at the moment you give birth to your child. They're going to die. I didn't want to drag that out. I just wanted to get it over with. Um, so we had a baby. And he died shortly after being born. And I remember feeling like it was my heart ripped out of my chest at that moment and just begging God to take me too. It sucked a little bit. Uh, I just can't get over how awesome my nurse and my doctor were. I sent them flowers later because my doctor was like eight months pregnant at that point and I can't imagine what it would have to be like being pregnant with your own child and having to be there for a mom who was going to lose hers. She was awesome. Anyways, um, so left the hospital and um, went home to heal which sucks because you have to like strap your breasts so your milk doesn't come in and it's super painful and the whole time you're still bleeding. It hurts to walk. It's all of those new pains that you get when you deliver a child, but you don't get the child. So it's hard. Uh, I was completely broken in that time. Broken to the point I couldn't even pray. But I remember thinking that's okay because I knew there were people praying for me and I could feel it. I never felt, even though I was broken, I never felt like I was in a dark hole. I just felt like I was um, standing a little bit aside, not alone. I don't know. I don't know that I can explain it. It was just broken. <laughs> Um, I listened to this song on repeat all the time. It was You Alone by North Point Inside Out with Lauren Daigle. And I listened to that on YouTube over and over and over and over and over. And to this day, anytime I have somebody who is like going through a struggle and just like, where is God in this? Like, I'm like, here's your song. Put it on repeat. It's good. Um... So feel free to check that out. I finally like went back to work after about six weeks, but I was really struggling with um, panic attacks and anxiety. Just being around people gave me anxiety. I started doing my grocery shopping at 5.30 in the morning just because I didn't want to run into anybody that I knew and have it be a conversation or have it be awkward because it's really... It hurts when people don't know how to react and so they act like nothing happened or they act like they don't see you because they don't know how to react and I don't judge them for it but it hurts but it also hurts when they acknowledge it and they want to give you a hug or they want to say something because nobody wants to cry in public um, so it just it hurt to be around people it was hard and I was having <clears throat> panic attacks when driving. There was one time my husband had to come get me off the interstate because my car broke down. Well, it didn't technically break down because it started back up, but I had a full-blown panic attack, like hysterical panic attack. And they were just, they kept happening. Um, and sometimes I still struggle with that. The weirdest triggers. I don't know. Uh, I lost my train of thought now. So for about a year and a half, like I still cried every morning in my bathroom because this was my new normal. And that sucks too, knowing that your new normal was crying in the bathroom every morning and then trying to get through the rest of the day pretending like you're okay. Um, 
shortly after we lost Noah, my friend Emily gave me this book. I'm a big book reader and I love like books that inspire and motivate. So this is the book that she gave me. Um, it's Through the Eyes of the Lion, Through the Eyes of a Lion by Levi Lusco. And it's a book about, he wrote after they lost their four-year-old daughter. She died of a asthma attack just a couple days before Christmas. And it was the struggle that him and his family and his wife went through, going through that and after that. And it's also a story about hope after going through that kind of trauma. And when I started reading the book, it was in August, I think the middle of August, end of August, something like that. But the book begins with a story about how Levi used to love to lay in his yard at night with his daughters during the Persides meteor shower. And he would tell them, you see all these like thousands and thousands of like shooting stars coming everywhere. And he would tell them, those stars are still there in the daytime. They're still shooting and they're still all over the place zooming down, but you need the dark to see it. And it was an incredible lesson of sometimes you need the darkness to reveal the beauty that's always there, has been there, and will continue to be there. Ironically enough, uh, the day that I started to read this book was the first day of the Persides meteor shower. So I was like, okay, God, I get it. I'm supposed to read this book. Um, I'll attach a link here if I can figure out how to do that. For anybody who's interested in book, I am a huge fan of um, anybody who's gone through something similar, I think should read this because it's, you're not alone and we're all trying to find our new normal and it's been three years now and I'm still daily struggling to find my new normal. But there is hope. Um... And it kind of pisses me off when people say God will never give you more than you can handle because that's misquoting the Bible and that's not accurate. The verse that they're referring to, it says God will never tempt you without giving you a way out. He will never allow temptation without giving you a way to get out of it. It has nothing to do with what you can handle. And God will regularly give you more than you can handle because that's when he can shine when you have to struggle through something that you don't want to and that you're just like how is this not going to destroy me that's when god can use you and it's in those moments that god just asks us for a little bit of faith and a little bit of trust and sometimes God puts blessings on the other side of having to go through something hard, and sometimes he doesn't. And the thing is, I had I was so convinced God was not going to let me lose my baby because he gifted it to me because I was being obedient. I said I'd go to Romania, so he was not going to let me lose my baby. Well, guess what? You can't put God in a box. It wasn't for me to decide what God could do and couldn't do. He doesn't need my input, and I'm okay with that. And I refuse to say that God took my baby for a reason, because I wanted him. But I do believe God can use my story and the strength that comes from going through shit. Um, Unfortunately, there's really no other way to acquire that kind of strength. And let me tell you, in the last couple of years, I have met some incredibly strong women. And when you admire those women, you need to know that, that it was going through shit that made them strong. Um... I did end up going to Romania, just so you know. It was a full year later. Um, my baby's due date would have been 
December 5th. And I was in Romania during that time. And I was so proud of myself for being obedient that I went. But I didn't go for them. I went for me. And I went there. I was asked to go and cut hair for children in the orphanages and um, with the gypsies. And I did. And it was terrifying. But it was very rewarding. And I struggled through it. But I want to go back. And now that I know, um, I can look on the other side of what I went through and, and what I did in Romania. I obeyed God, but I went there for me, thinking he was going to do something miraculous. And I kept waiting for me to be affected. Uh, or, you know, oh, look at me. I'm, I'm doing something so great for these kids. Look, like... Look at me over here doing something great. And I feel like when I got home from that trip with no baby still <laughs> that um, God gave me that opportunity to go to Romania as a way to see that. There are so many people that have so much less in life and there are so many people that um have gone through way worse than i have and they still have daily joy they don't know any different they don't know that life could be better but that joy that they have is something that if more and more of us could just appreciate um i think the world would be a better place so three years later I'm doing all right. I'm trying to restart my career. And I'm a very big believer as a hairstylist that there is power in change. And I even did a video on Facebook a couple, uh, like two years ago, about how sometimes just changing your outward appearance can have such a positive change on your inward. Um, how you feel on the inside. And I feel like it's my mission in life to share that with as many women as I can. And I'm not saying men don't deserve that too, but I just feel that for us women, sometimes changing your look, getting fresh hair, changing your haircut, learning how to do some makeup tricks, it can give you a little bit of boost of confidence and it can kind of like trigger that reset button for you and kind of help get you out of a dump and I want to be there for those women that need that and I want to be a resource for how can I find my hope again after the trauma that I've gone through and how can I find joy again and knowing that my new normal um it can still be good so that's that's my story my baby loss story and um surviving it, coming through it, and what I've learned. If you know anybody that needs some of these resources, um, like I said, I'll see if I can figure out how to put links to these books. Um, Stark Raving Obedience and Through the Eyes of the Lion, both very, very good. Levi Lesko's wife, Jenny, also wrote a book. Um, the title's escaping me right now, but it's from her perspective of the trauma that they went through with losing their daughter and the mom guilt that comes along because losing a child, like the mom guilt is just <sighs> awful. So I would highly recommend these to anybody who's looking to try to live their life more lined up with what God wants for them or somebody who just needs to know that there can be hope after surviving horrible loss. So, um, I hope you guys have a good day. Feel free to comment, like, subscribe, and thank you to my three subscribers for, you know, supporting me. Have a good day. Bye, guys.